A lot of Trip Team family members have been writing to me. They're saying, Willie, the jar pasteurization tech, the pillowcase pasteurization tech, they work perfectly fine. That's what I've been using up until this point, but I'm growing a lot more. I burn through substrate left and right, and if I want to keep up using one of those two methods, it's just too time consuming. How do the big companies that sell substrate pasteurize huge amounts of substrate at one shot? Well, since we have our Mega Mono Tub series about to drop, we need a lot of substrate ourselves. So I thought I would take the time to show you guys how to make your own bulk pasteurization unit for under $100. You guys have been asking for this video. I'm really excited to give it to you. So let's jump right into it. Dripping on acid in the hotel lobby. Everything moving hella fast, Ricky Bobby. Floating in the ethers. Listen to the ethers, you can probably tell the future. Superhuman man. What's going on, Trip Team? First of all, I know you guys are probably like, Willie, what's up with the mask? So I'm wearing this mask in this video. Don't worry, I have all my other masks. They're sitting right there. They're perfectly fine. Actually, you can see one right behind me on the shelf. But I'm wearing this mask to show love, show support to one of our Trip Team family members, D-Rock the Menace. Now, if you guys don't know who D-Rock the Menace is, at the beginning of my videos, the song that plays, that's D-Rock the Menace. He's a psychedelic hip hop artist. His music's absolutely crazy. He talks about psychedelic journeys and different psychedelics and the astral plane and all types of really good stuff. His music is really, really good. So make sure you guys go show him some love. His Instagram, all that stuff will be in the description. He's a Trip Team family member. He's a really good dude and he puts out really good music. So make sure you guys check him out. With that said, I wanna welcome you guys back to a brand new video. As always, I wanna thank you guys for all your love and support. So last week's video, we covered setting up our Mega Mono Tub. You guys remember that video? Great video, it was just part one. There's gonna be more to come starting next week. But before we do that, we need to get our substrate ready. So a lot of you guys have been asking me, Willie, how do we make a whole bunch of substrate? And if you guys want to use the jar method or the pillowcase method, that's perfectly fine. You guys could do that. But if you guys really want to step things up to a professional level, this is the way you do it. So what is a bulk pasteurization unit? I know a lot of you guys are probably asking. So what a bulk pasteurization unit is a unit that could hold a lot of substrate that will pasteurize it. It's very simple to make as long as you have the right equipment and the knowledge to do so. So that's what we're gonna be doing right here in this video. So with all that said, let's jump right into it. First, let's talk about what you're gonna to need to follow along with this video. So the first thing you need to get is one of these right here. This is a heavy duty tub. If you guys ain't sure what I'm using in this video, you wanna get the same exact thing, just go into the description. I'm gonna put the links for everything I use in this video. So in case you're not sure what it is, where to get it, all the links will be in the description below. This heavy duty tub cost about seven, eight dollars with the lid, which is a really good deal because this essentially is gonna be a pasteurization unit. So you want it to stand up to heat and stuff like that. So this is a really good one. This is the one I use all the time, anytime that I make one. And it's held up really, really well. Now you have to understand, you don't wanna use one of the cheap Sterilite bins that we use for our mono tubs or our shotgun fruiting chambers. They're not gonna hold up that well to the heat. You gotta remember, this is gonna get up to some really high temperatures. So you wanna make sure that it's nice and sturdy so it doesn't collapse on you and you don't run through them left and right. If you build it with the right supplies, you guys will have this for many years to come. So it's a really good investment. And like I said, we're gonna do this for as cheap as possible. The next thing you guys are gonna need is some RTV. Now this is high temperature silicone. This is the same exact stuff that we use to make our self healing injection ports. Now, if you guys have some laying around your house, which most of you probably will because you've already been growing, if you're planning on making a bulk pasteurization unit, you guys could just use what you have. You don't need very much for this tech. Next, you guys are gonna need some high temperature tubing. This is flexible high temperature tubing. It comes in many different colors. You guys could get any color that you want. The only thing I suggest doing is make sure you get more than you actually need because you're gonna want it to run from your pressure cooker to the pasteurization unit itself. So it's always better to have a little bit extra than not enough. So I suggest getting 10 feet or more 
when you guys are building your pasteurization unit. Now, real quick, I just wanna show you guys something to save you a lot of headache and a lot of time. If you guys go to the hardware store to buy the tubing yourself, what you wanna do is take the top to your pressure cooker. The reason for that is right there. You guys wanna match the holes up with the pressure cooker top. You wanna make sure the holes is the same circumference as the weight to your pressure cooker. Very, very important. That way you know when you come back home, it's gonna fit on top of your pressure cooker nice and snug. It's not gonna be too big, it's not gonna be too small. Another thing you wanna get is a little breeze clamp. So this is a breeze clamp. They come in many different sizes. You guys wanna make sure it will fit around your tubing. This is gonna clamp things down so we don't get the hose popping off once steam builds up. So make sure you guys buy at least one breeze clamp that fits the hose that you guys purchase. The next thing you guys will need is a deep fry or a candy thermometer. It's the same exact thing as a meat thermometer, except it's a lot longer. You guys want the longer version. If you guys can't get one, then you guys could use a meat thermometer, but it's gonna be a lot more accurate if you guys have one of these that are a lot longer. And you'll see why later in the video. Now the next item I'm gonna show you guys is 100% optional, but if you guys grab one, it will help you out a lot. It will make things a lot cleaner, a lot more sturdy. So this is a rack. It's an adjustable metal rack that you could change the height up and down. And what we do with this is we put it in the bottom of our pasteurization unit and then our substrate bag goes on top of this. So that way it's not sitting inside the water that pools up at the bottom of the unit. Now, for a long time I didn't have one of these racks so what I used was just jars or pots upside down and pretty much just put my bag of substrate on top of that and that kept it out of the water and it worked perfectly fine. But one of these racks definitely makes things a lot easier. Like I said, all the links will be down below. So don't worry about it if you don't know where to get it or what it is. All the links will be down there. The last thing you guys are going to need for this video is a pressure cooker. Now, most of you guys already have a pressure cooker. If you don't have one, I'll put a link to a cheap, good one in the description below that will come in handy many times during your mycology journey. You're gonna have to sterilize grains and sterilize agar and all types of stuff. So you guys wanna invest in a pressure cooker. If you guys are making a bulk pasteurization unit, chances are you already have a pressure cooker. So I'm gonna just avoid that whole talk and we're gonna jump right into it. Now, any pressure cooker will work. It doesn't have to be a 22 quart or a 12 quart. It doesn't matter. It can't be an electric pressure cooker. It has to be a stove top. The reason for that is, at the top of the stovetop ones, we put our weights, they have a nipple that releases steam. We need that. So if you guys are gonna be making this pasteurization unit right here, you guys are gonna need a stovetop pressure cooker. I'll put a link in the description like I said, but most of you guys already have a pressure cooker, so let's move forward. All right guys, so hopefully these are some good angles for you guys so you don't miss a thing. Pretty much we got a nice top view so you guys could see what we have going on here. And then over there we have a wide view so you guys could see everything so you don't miss a thing. This is the best part about Patreon. We're able to get really good equipment so you guys don't miss a thing. So I want to thank all of you guys that support me on Patreon. And if you're not a Patreon supporter, consider checking it out. You get a lot of extras and it helps create things like this. So let me show you guys real quick. So this is the top to the pressure cooker that I'm gonna be using for this pasteurization unit right here. And as you guys can see, this is the tubing. It has to be able to fit on that nipple nice and snug, just like that. You guys don't want it to pull off easily. Plus we also have the breeze clamp so now when we put it on, we'll be able to clamp it down right at the nipple so that way it doesn't pop off when we're pasteurizing our substrate. So the first thing we need to do when we start setting up our bulk pasteurization unit is we need to figure out what's gonna be the location for our steam hose and what's gonna be the location for our thermometer. So for the thermometer, what I like to do is I like to place it right in the middle because I know my substrate's gonna be right there. I want that thermometer spike to go right into my substrate so I can get a core temperature because that's what's important. When we're monitoring the temperature, when we're pasteurizing, 
we're concerned about that core temperature. We're not concerned about the outer temperature. We're concerned about the core temperature. So we need to focus on that. So I'm gonna put it right in the middle. So it's gonna go right here. So if you guys are using the same exact thermometer that I'm using right here, I know the spike size. So we're gonna be using a 964 drill bit. So we could drill a hole right into the center of this diamond so that our thermometer is in the middle of our pasteurization unit. Now, if you guys are using something different, it might be different, but what I suggest if you guys ain't 100% sure, always start smaller and work your way up from there. Never start bigger because you can't go backwards. Always start small and then work your way up. So I got my drill right here. I got my 964 bit. So I'm gonna put it in here and I'm gonna drill that hole. So like I said, I want it right in the middle. Doesn't have to be perfect, but the more centered you could get it, the better. That looks about centered to me. Nice and easy, just like that. And you guys will have a perfect hole. Now, before I push my thermometer through that hole, I always like to remove that back part that clips it onto the pan. So I'll just remove that and I'll get rid of it. Now, as you guys could see, it fits nice and snug. It's not just falling down under its own weight. It's in there nice and snug. So what I'll do is I'll push this all the way down and then I'll make sure it's in the position that I want it. So when I'm viewing it, I can see it easily. I'm not trying to turn my head to figure out what temperature it's at. And as you guys could see, it goes down pretty far. And that's what we want, because we want it to go into our substrate. So now that we have our thermometer where we want it, now we need to figure out where we're gonna put our tubing that's gonna feed the steam into our pasteurizer. So I know that this tubing is a half inch in diameter. So I'm gonna use a half inch drill bit to drill a hole so I could fit this tubing in. Now before you drill your hole, you need to figure out where you want your tubing to be. Now, I've done a lot of trial and error with this. I've been building these for a very long time. And I can tell you the best place to put the tubing is in one of the corners. You guys want to put it in one of the corners. You don't want to put it in the middle. You don't want to put it where it's going to be right directly on top of your substrate because water is going to leak down and you don't want it leaking directly on your substrate. So what I like to do is I like to put it in one of the corners. It doesn't matter which one. You guys could choose which one you want to use, but pretty much that's how I like to do it. So that way the steam is being fed in from the corner instead of directly over the top of my substrate. All right, guys, so I have my half inch drill bit right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill right here into this corner so that way you guys could get the best view of it. But like I said, it really doesn't matter. Choose whatever corner you want to use. Some people even like to feed it in through the side of the bin, which I really don't like to do. I like to have everything right here on my lid. So that way when I'm done using my pasteurization unit, I could just unplug everything, put it right on top and put it off to the side until the next time I need it. If you have the thermometer through the top, the holes through the side. Now it's this contraption that has things popping out of everywhere. So if you use everything right here on the lid, it makes things a lot cleaner and a lot easier to store away until you need it. So I'm gonna put it in right here at this corner. So what I'm gonna do is just put my drill bit down and I'm gonna start slowly. It doesn't take much to drill that hole. So as you guys could see, the hole's right there and that's where we're gonna feed the tubing through. All right guys, so now we have this hole drilled. That's gonna be for our tubing that we're gonna run through. Now, if you guys have any frayed pieces of plastic, if you guys just wanna go around and clean it up the best you can because the better seal you could get, the better your pasteurization unit is gonna work. So you guys wanna make sure it's nice and clean so that way you could seal it up really, really good. So now that that's all taken care of, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna RTV around our thermometer. All right guys, so I have my RTV right here. Now a little trick that's gonna help you guys out is when you cut your nozzle, you guys wanna cut it at a 45 degree angle. This is gonna help out when you guys go around your thermometer and you guys go around your tubing. It's gonna help you get a lot cleaner results. So if you guys cut it at a 45 degree angle, 
you guys will be good. All right, guys, so before you RTV anything, you guys want to make sure your thermometer is flush with the top side. You want to pull it through and make sure it's all the way down. As long as it's all the way down and flush with the top of your bin, now you guys could flip it over and we could start to RTV around the thermometer. We want a really good seal so no steam or water gets through. All right, so what I like to do, like I said, 45 degree angle. And I just go around it nice and clean. All right, you guys, I just adjusted the color of my lights a little bit so you guys could get a better view. That's what it should look like right there. You guys want a nice, tight, waterproof seal around your thermometer, just like that. All right, guys, so now what we need to do is we need to take our high temperature tubing and we need to run it through the hole that we drilled in our lid. So once you run it through the hole, you want to pull it through and you want to pull through three to four inches of slack, just like this. I don't like having a bunch of extra tubing inside my pasteurization unit. So three to four inches works perfectly fine. It will be up there on top and there will be no obstructions with the steam when it starts pouring through. Once you guys have your tubing running through and you got three to four inches of slack, now you guys could RTV around the tubing. Just like we did with the thermometer, you guys wanna go very easy and make sure you have a nice seal. Now be generous with the RTV, don't worry guys, you have plenty of it. You wanna make sure you have a nice thick seal around this tubing, just like this. If you guys want, you could lay it on nice and thick and then with a popsicle stick or something, you guys could go around and smooth things out if you want it to look really good. But it really doesn't matter, it's not gonna have any effect on the functionality of it. So if you guys want, just lay a nice thick waterproof seal around it and once you guys do that, you're all done. Pretty much now what we need to do is we need to let this cure. So it has to cure over a 24 hour period. So we have to let it harden up. So we're gonna leave this overnight and tomorrow we'll come back. This should be all cured and then we can move on to the next step. All right guys, so it's 24 hours later and our RTV has cured. So now we can start to assemble the pasteurizing unit. So as you guys can see, it's in there nice and good, not going nowhere. This has cured all the way through. You guys don't want to rush this because if you rush it, it won't cure right and you guys will have steam leaks and then your hose will come loose and you won't get an accurate temperature. So you guys want to make sure you cure it the right way. All right guys, so as you can see, I put my rack inside my pasteurization unit now this rack is adjustable so I could set it to low profile or I could set it higher up just like this right here. Now normally what I use is I use the higher setting because what I like to do is when I fill my trash bag with my substrate, I'll lay it out flat on this rack. I want a lower profile that's higher up because I want that skewer from our thermometer to go right into the center of our substrate. That's how you're gonna get the most accurate temperature reading. Now, if you guys wanna do more substrate, you guys could set it to the low profile setting, drop it down, and you guys will be able to fill more substrate into your bag and into the pasteurization unit. And depending on how long your thermometer is, that's what's gonna determine how far into your substrate it goes. Now, I just like to get a nice center reading. If you guys could get a center reading even if it's a couple inches down, it's gonna be like that all the way through. So you guys don't need to worry about it being exactly in the center of your bag. The really confusing thing about substrate for a new person starting out is the difference between pasteurization and sterilization. Two completely different things. When you guys are making bulk substrate, you wanna pasteurize. When you guys are making your grains to inoculate, you wanna sterilize. It's two completely different things. What we're accomplishing by pasteurizing is we're trying to kill off all the bad bacteria that could be in the substrate, but still leave behind the good stuff. When you sterilize, think of it as you dropped a nuke on it. You're pretty much killing everything that's there so that the mycelium could take hold and it doesn't have to fight anything in its infancy. 
because when it's just starting to colonize, it's very weak. But since we're putting a bunch of colonized inoculation points into our bulk substrate, it's a lot more ferocious, right? It could fight back other things that it couldn't before. So that's the difference between pasteurization and sterilization. So what we're building right here is a pasteurization unit. This is for bulk substrate, this is for casings, this is for straw. Now you can't sterilize a whole bunch of grains in here. You just can't do it. What you're gonna end up doing is pasteurizing them. And if you try to inoculate pasteurized grains, it's just gonna get contaminated. So now that you guys see how we set up the top, you guys see how we set up the inside, now I'm going to show you guys a mock-up of how I would set it up before I go to pasteurize some substrate. All right, guys, so as you can see, I got a mock-up bag of substrate right here. Now, I was thinking about making substrate with you guys in this video and doing the whole thing, but I didn't want to drag this video out. I wanted this video to be about this unit, not about making substrate. Now, if you guys ain't sure how to make substrate, don't worry about it. Just go into my video library. You guys can find it anywhere. I have many videos on making substrate, different types of substrate, different ways of pasteurization. So don't worry about it. My favorite substrate to make is a 90-10 substrate. So I use 90% manure, 10% vermiculite, and then whatever the total value is of them two items combined. Say I use 10 cups of, or one cup of vermiculite, nine cups of manure, then I would add 5% of that total value in gypsum, which is a half a cup. Then what I would do is I would mix it up all in a big bowl or a five gallon bucket or even a barrel, depending on how much substrate I'm making. And I would mix it all up, get it to field capacity, which I talk about in my other videos. Field capacity is pretty much the moisture level of soil outside. So if you went, took a shovel, dug down, grabbed some soil, squeezed it in your hands, it's wet, but it's not soaking wet. That's filled capacity. You guys would bring it to filled capacity, fill up your trash bag. So this is a heavy duty black trash bag. You guys could use a clear trash bag. You guys could use a yellow trash bag. It doesn't matter the color. This is just a black heavy duty trash bag. You guys just make sure you're using heavy duty. You'd fill up your filled capacity substrate right here. You'd tie it off. Then what you would do is you would take your lid and either through an opening in the top of the bag or you'd just go through the bag itself with your spike from your thermometer. You'd go right through like I just did poke it down, make sure your top's on there nice and snug, and now you're all set. What some people like to do, and I've done it, but it's not a big deal if you don't, because if you guys do it once, you're not going back and forth, back and forth, you guys will get a nice sale between the bag and the thermometer. So right now, if I lift this up, since there's no substrate in it, I don't mind showing you guys. You guys can see it's pulling up the bag with it. That's how good the sale is. So right now the thermometer is through the bag. Some people, like I said, like to take tape. They'll take clear tape or some type of, you know, scotch tape and they'll tape around the thermometer and the bag where it meets just to make sure no steam re-enters the bag and throws off their failed capacity. Now, let me tell you guys something. If by chance, some water gets into your bag, it's not gonna make a huge difference. And even if it did, let's say, you could always bring it back to filled capacity. So you wanna try to prevent water from going into the bag if you can, but even if a little bit got in, you probably wouldn't notice it. And if you did notice it, you could still correct it. So as long as you guys understand that, you guys will be good. Now, like I said, if you guys don't have a rack or you don't buy the rack that I show in this video, you guys could always use quart mason jars or you guys could go and find some type of metal rack system or PVC rack system 
and put it at the bottom. Like I said, adjustable is good because you never know how much substrate you're gonna make. Maybe you wanna make less, so you're gonna have to raise the rack up. Maybe you wanna make more, so you're gonna drop it down. It really just depends. Now, if you guys get this thermometer, no matter if you have the rack set all the way to the bottom or set all the way to the top, this thermometer will work perfectly. It will go all the way down to the bottom. It will work if you have it all the way at the top. It really doesn't matter. So now that I showed you guys how I load my substrate bag into the pasteurization unit and how I put my thermometer through, now I wanna show you guys how I set it up with the pressure cooker and what I do before I'm about to pasteurize this substrate. Really quick tip guys, you wanna make sure your substrate your bag, everything is all loaded before you turn the pressure cooker on. You guys want the heat to build up gradually. You don't wanna throw your substrate in there once it's already hot because the problem with that is thermodynamics. So we're trying to get the core to a certain temperature. So if we throw the bag of substrate in there once it's already hot and steamy inside here, what's gonna happen is the outside is gonna heat up a lot quicker than the inside. So we're gonna have the outside at really high temperatures while the core temperature is still low. And we're not gonna get a correct pasteurization on that substrate. So you wanna let everything build up gradually together. So you wanna make sure the substrate is loaded in there, everything's all set, you close it up, then you set up your pressure cooker and turn it on and let everything do its thing. All right guys, so this is pretty much the setup right here. So if you guys were gonna go and pasteurize some substrate right now, you would fill up your bag with your substrate, you'd load it up into your pasteurization unit, you'd shut the lid, you'd make sure that your thermometer or the way that you're reading the temperature is in the core of the bag and then you would run your steam hose to the nozzle on your pressure cooker. You would take your little breeze clamp, you'd lock it down so that it doesn't pop off. Then what you would do is you would fill your pressure cooker with water. Now, when you guys fill it with water, don't worry about filling it the same way you would fill it if you guys were about to pressure cook some grains where you only fill it up with a little bit of water to the rack. You guys wanna fill this thing up with water halfway or more because the steam's gonna be escaping through this hole so it's gonna run down really fast. So you guys wanna fill it up with a bunch of water. Then what you guys wanna do is lock your top. You wanna put it on your stove and you wanna turn it on high. What's gonna happen is steam is gonna start to build and run down the hose and into your pasteurization unit. Now, what you guys wanna do is achieve them temperatures for pasteurization. So what I like to do is once I see it get to about 145 degrees Fahrenheit on my thermometer, I'll shut off my pressure cooker or I'll turn it to really, really low and then it will continue to build. So you'll continue to see the temperature build even after you've shut off the pressure cooker because the core is still getting hot from the outsides of the substrate and it's still hot inside the pasteurization unit. So if you guys shut it off at about 145 Fahrenheit, it should rise to about 165, 170 degrees Fahrenheit before it stops rising anymore. Then what you wanna do is once you hit them temperatures between 160 and 170, you guys wanna maintain that 10 degrees Fahrenheit range. So between 170 Fahrenheit and 160 Fahrenheit. Now, once you guys achieve them temperatures between 160 degrees Fahrenheit and 170 degrees Fahrenheit, you guys wanna maintain that temperature and start your timer. So I like to let mines pasteurize for about anywhere between 70 and 90 minutes, usually gets the job done. Now, if you guys come back and you see your temperature has dipped below 160 degrees Fahrenheit, just turn your pressure cooker back on and let the steam start going in there again until it rises back up to your desired temperature, then shut it off. 
So that's what you guys want to do. So let's say you guys come back, you see your temperature has dropped to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. What you want to do is turn your pressure cooker back on and you want to let that temperature build back up right to where it's about to hit 160 Fahrenheit. Then shut off your pressure cooker. It will continue to build a little bit. And then you guys start your countdown again from where you left off. So if you guys had 40 minutes in pasteurization when the temperature dropped below 160, then you guys will pick back up at the 40 minute mark once you get it back into that temperature range. Hopefully that's not confusing, but if you guys built your pasteurization unit the correct way, you guys don't need to worry about that. I've never seen my pasteurization units dip below where they're supposed to be. So at about 145, I shut off my pressure cooker. It starts to continue to build up till it hits about 170. And once I see it hit that 170 mark, that's when I start my timer. And I like to keep it in the pasteurization unit for about 70 to 90 minutes. Usually I keep it on the longer side, 90 minutes. But if you guys wanna finish up a little bit quicker, I've seen people get away with 70 minutes, 80 minutes, times like that. So don't worry about it too much. Like I said, we're pasteurizing, we're not sterilizing. Now, very important guys, pay attention. This will be on your stove. This will be on the floor or on a countertop next to your stove. The most important thing, and this is something I learned very early on, if you guys have hardwood floors or something like that, or you don't want your floors to warp or change shape or anything like that, the best thing to do is to put this pasteurization unit on top of another bin. So buy two of these, flip the other one upside down or put the lid on and then put this on top of that. If you don't wanna buy two of these bins and you have some five gallon buckets laying around, what I do is I just flip the five gallon buckets upside down. I place my pasteurization unit on top of the buckets and that will create a barrier between the floor and the pasteurization unit so that no heat is touching your floor. Now, even because the core temperature gets up to 170 degrees Fahrenheit, which most people are probably thinking, well, that's not really that hot. You have to remember that's the core temperature. So the steam that's in here is still really, really hot, upwards of around 190 degrees Fahrenheit at times. So when you guys open this up, always use hand protection. Consider it the same exact thing like the lid to your pressure cooker. You guys don't wanna be lifting this up without hand protection. And when you guys lift it up, make sure you lift it up away from you. You guys don't wanna be looking in here when you pull up the lid because steam's gonna come up. You'll end up burning your face, your eyes, your arms, your hands, whatever's exposed at that moment. Very, very important. Treat this just like you would treat your pressure cooker. Now, once I've hit that 160 degrees Fahrenheit to 170 degrees Fahrenheit, and I've maintained that for about 90 minutes, what I'll do is once I hit that 90 minute mark, I'll remove the lid, I'll take some hand protection, so an oven mitt or something like that, or some type of thermal resistant glove. I'll grab my substrate and I'll place it on a rack somewhere so that it could cool. I won't leave it inside here because I don't want it to continue sitting inside the heat because what will end up happening is if it stays in here too long, you're gonna over pasteurize, which is just as bad as under pasteurizing. So you guys want to remove it as soon as you've hit that time frame. So 160 degrees Fahrenheit to 170 degrees Fahrenheit for around 90 minutes. That's going to pasteurize your substrate. Once it cools to room temperature, you guys are good. So I'll do this at night. I'll pull it out before I go to sleep. I'll put it on a rack off to the side and overnight it will cool. I'll come back in the morning and it's ready to use. Now, another thing you guys could do once you figure out where your pasteurization unit is gonna go and where your stove is, you guys could come to this end of the hose. You could cut it so that it's a shorter distance. Cause as you guys can see, look at all this excess hose that we have. I would never leave it like this. The reason for that is the steam has to travel from here to here. And if you have all this hose with all these twirls and spins all in it, 
what's gonna end up happening is the steam is gonna get caught in certain areas and it's not gonna be very efficient and heat up your pasteurization unit the way it's supposed to. Now, some people don't even like to do this in the house at all, but some people don't have an option to do it outside. Some people like to take their propane burner outside, so they'll bring their pressure cooker outside, they'll put it on the propane burner, and they'll do it outside, which is great. If you have the space and the, you know, the equipment to do so, do it that way. I suggest doing it that way every single time. But some people don't have that luxury. Some people live in the city. Some people live in a place where they just can't do that. So if you guys want to do it in your kitchen, that's perfectly fine. Like I said, the most important thing is just remember this is going to get very hot. So you guys want to make sure it's on top of some type of rack, another bin, some five gallon buckets, just some type of barrier between the actual floor, the actual countertop, and the pasteurization unit itself. As long as you guys do that, you guys will be good. Another thing, which I'm sure I don't even have to tell you guys, but I just want to make sure all the bases are covered, kids and animals. Very, very important. This is going to get very hot. You want to make sure there's no children running around, you know, that could bump into it, that could touch it. No dogs that are going to come up, get curious and put their nose to it or jump on top of it. So important, guys. I don't want to see anybody get hurt. You know, this is a great device. It does what it's supposed to do, but it's also up to you to be responsible. So you guys have to make sure you take the necessary precautions if you guys are gonna do this. With that said, guys, that's pretty much it. That's what it is. That's how you build a pasteurization unit. That's how you load it up, and that's how you actually use it. That's all the do's and don'ts about it. Now, like I said, make sure you use a heavy-duty bin. This is extremely heavy-duty. This isn't one of them cheap bins that you buy at Target for you know the monotubs or the shotgun fruiting chambers. This is heavy-duty. Actually, a lot of guys use this for hydroponic setups. So a lot of you cannabis growers out there will know exactly what this is, where to get it. You might even have one laying around. If you guys could get something more heavy duty, go for it. Now, what I've used in the past to make my pasteurization units is a cooler. And I know a lot of people in the mycology community use a cooler as well. So like one of the Coleman or the Igloo coolers, you guys could use those. They come in various different sizes. Sometimes the lid is attached by hinges, sometimes it isn't. It really doesn't matter. You guys could use either or. And those work really, really good. They're insulated, they do a really good job. They're just a little bit more expensive than one of these heavy duty bins. But if you guys have one laying around or you wanna make the investment and purchase one, they work really, really good. Just like this, but even better. So there you go, guys. That's how you make your pasteurization unit right there. A lot of you guys have been asking for this video, and this was the right time to give it, considering we're about to do our Mega Monotech, which is going to be happening next week, which I'm really excited, so I can't wait for you guys to see that and join along. I, I can't wait to see your grows, because every time you guys follow one of my techs, you're always tagging me in it, and I check out them photos. Even though I don't always have the time to respond because I'm trying to film these videos, I'm traveling to film other videos, and I'm always trying to work to expand the Trip Team family. I still see it when I'm on a plane, when I'm in the Trip Team studio, when I'm at home just chilling with my dogs. I'm sitting there, I'm on the phone, I'm checking out everything. I'm seeing what you guys say, I don't always get a chance to respond, but that's just what it is. A lot of people write to me, a lot of people ask me to respond and ask me questions and I want to respond to everybody. I do. I really, really do. But sometimes there's just not enough time to get back to people in a timely fashion. It's just impossible. Now, if you guys are persistent and you write to me, you tag me, eventually I will have a chance to write back. But if you guys need direct contact with me, you guys want to get in touch with me right away, just consider going and checking out my Patreon. My Patreon is the easiest, most effective way to get in touch with me. If you try to get in touch with me on social media, it's very, very difficult because so many people write to me. I mean, it's to the point where my DM box just says 99 plus. 
because it doesn't go any higher. I have thousands of messages and I just can't get to all of them. I know people write to me all the time and say, Willie, answer your DMs. I am answering DMs. You're just in the mix with a bazillion other people asking questions, you know, and I want to answer your question. I do, but I need to get to it. But before I do that, there's other people that have wrote to me that are still waiting on responses. So if you guys want to cut all that bullshit, you want to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, you want to Skype with me one-on-one, -on -one, you want me to check out your girl, answer any questions, check out my Patreon. That's what the Patreon's there for. The Patreon's there so you guys could talk with me directly and get assistance and stuff like that, get extra videos and early releases. That's what it's there for. That's what it is. And of course, you guys could go to willymichael.com to get all my videos. So any video that's ever came out is on willymichael.com, which is my website. You guys could go over there. You guys could write to me on there. Of course, I get a lot of messages through there, but I try to get back to as many of you as possible. You guys know me. You know I'm a good person, and I love you guys, and I want to talk and hang out with every one of you, but it's impossible. I'm one person trying to do a bunch of things to keep everybody happy, so please bear with me, and I want to thank you for your patience because a lot of you guys are extremely patient and extremely understandable. It's just a few people that get upset and it's nothing personal it's just i could only do what i could do i'm i'm human guys i'm one of you i'm i'm not a superhuman so thank you guys for everybody that supports me hopefully you guys enjoyed this video i love you guys like I said, shout out to D-Rock the Menace. Thank you for the mask, brother. He got a couple different options. If you guys want to go check him out, purchase one of these masks, take a picture on Instagram or whatever, tag me, tag him. You'll get a follow back just for showing your support. And that's pretty much it. So thank you guys so much. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you guys like the new setup with the new cameras, the new angles and all that stuff. You know, we've really stepped our quality up big time. I mean, and it's all because of Patreon. All the Patreon money, this is what it goes towards, making the videos better, giving you guys better content. So I want to thank all of you guys that support me on Patreon. And as always, I love you guys. I'm Willie Michael. Do good, be good, live good. Namaste.